So welcome back. We are here at the SyncUp Conference in New Orleans, Louisiana. Uh, we are at the George and Joyce Ween Jazz and Heritage Center, the brand new community and education center uh, owned by the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Foundation. This is our eighth annual SyncUp Conference. Today is the second day of the 2015 SyncUp Conference, and with our third presentation of the day, we have Matt Pincus, the founder and CEO of Songs Music Publishing. So we're here to talk about music publishing and the publishing industry. Everybody, please welcome Matt Pincus. So I oh use the microphone because we're yeah. webcasting. Um, yeah, I don't know if, if you were here for the booking agent panel that we did earlier, but it was great. Oh, thank you. So I started by asking some of the the panelists, uh, I mean, who uh, who are in the in the industry, their booking agents, whether they really wanted to be a rock star. Uh -huh. And you actually did want to be a rock star, and so, and you are a rock star. I mean, I don't, let's not put it past. Well, you. thank you, Scott. But but you st you started as a musician. I did, yeah, I did. I I I uh, didn't go to college right out of high school. I I played in uh, punk rock and hardcore bands uh, in the late '80s. Um, and you and look so punk rock. I have to say. <laughs> I look a little different these days, but but um, but, but yeah, you were in hardcore bands. I was in hardcore bands. Like you're yes. a real headbanger. Yes, yes. From from the time I was about 15 um, until I was about 19, I uh, that's what I did. I went on tour and put out a couple records and and uh, you know lived that life. Yeah, for sure. Wow. That's what got me into this business. Oh, we had we had a phone chat a couple of days ago, and I asked you this question. It's like I I don't know a lot about your background, but I do know that you went to business school, and at the time you, you finished college, I mean, the, the, the world was wide open to you. You could have gone into any industry. You could have gone into advertising, automobile manufacturing, you could have, whatever. And you chose music publishing. I don't know that people necessarily think that, I mean, there's like this, this kind of catchphrase out there that all the money in music is in music publishing. So I suppose that's a better choice than going into, say, being a record label. Uh, but why, why music publishing? Why did you start a music publishing company? Well, uh, music has been a constant throughout my life. Since I was about 15 years old, I've been interested in the music industry in one way or another. Um, and it, it, I say to people often that music sort of saved my life on a couple of occasions. Um, I had a difficult time when I was a really young kid and got myself into some trouble. And it was actually straight edge hardcore that that got me out of that and put me on a path. Um, and then being in a band, you know, the thing about hardcore was that it was all DIY. We did everything ourselves. Um, we had our own record companies, our own promotion companies, our own publicity companies. And it really taught me the music industry. It gave me the building blocks of a career. So music has been a constant important ingredient in my life, you know, since I was a really young kid. Um, when I came out of business school, I did have, you know, some other career options. Um, and I could have probably switched to, you know, management consulting, um, you know, financial services, something like that. Um, but I have a you stamp could have been a stockbroker. Yeah, I could have, I, you know, but I have a stamp collector's fascination with music. And I, I think, you know, when you run a business, you have ups and downs. And, you know, there are times when it's not all glamorous and easy. And, you know, I think it's really important to have a tactile passion um, for the thing that it is you're doing. And if I was selling insurance, I think I'd have a hard time getting to work every morning. Um, and so for me, music was that constant, and, and, um, and it kept me interested, and, and it, it's, it's allowed me to do all sorts of things that I never imagined I would do. You could have gone to work for a music publisher. You could have tried to get a job at, you know... Um, well, I did. Oh. I, I worked at EMI. Okay. And... Um, and I had a corporate job there. Uh, I, my job was to try to buy the Warner Music Group. Um, so I was at the... Um, uh, so you were like in the mergers and acquisitions department. I was the, a functionary in that department. Right. Uh, I was the, responsible for coordinating the effort in, in one part of the business. Um, and uh, it taught me that EMI was largely getting out of the business um, at the time of representing contemporary songwriters. They were buying catalogs and you know interested in more proven um, cash flow producing songs that that uh, didn't have people attached to them um, but they weren't actually taking chances on young songwriters 
And a light bulb kind of went off in my head saying, well, if EMI, which was the biggest company in the industry, um, was not um, uh, actively signing writers, then probably the same thing was going on at Universal and at Warner and at Sony. And lo and behold, that's what was going on. Um, so when the Warner deal fell apart, I was kicking around at EMI with not a whole lot to do. Um, and I started looking at how many writers I could get in touch with and, and form relationships with. And so I actually started my company, I probably shouldn't say this, but I started my company at EMI um, and, uh, and began doing deals with um, mostly young, uh, working, contemporary songwriters. And that's still what I do. It's the only thing I do. When you started the company, what did you think? I mean, you probably know this better than most of us do, because music publishing is still very mysterious to people, even people that are like conversant with terms like mechanical royalties or whatever. The publishing it's business is complicated it, business. It's still very mysterious. The business that you're in now, is this what you expected? the business was going to be, what the job was going to be? Is, music, is, is it the thing that you thought it was going to be, or is music publishing, did it turn out to be something different than what you wanted it, or that you thought it was going to be when you started? Um, well, in, in a lot of ways, it, it, it's turned out better than I expected. Um, you know, we've had a lot of growth in the past three or four years um, that has gone uh, farther faster than, than, than I, I, I would have thought 10 years ago. Um, but it is the same business. I, you know, I was listening to the booking agent panel here earlier this morning, and, and one of the things that really struck a chord with me was how much they were talking about relationships. You know, music publishing is a complicated business. Um, people like to think of it as assets and cash flows and all these things. Um, but fundamentally, at the end of the day, it's about relationships with people and, and relationships with musicians and, and creative product. Um, and, and that is, is what it is today for me and what it always has been for me. Um, so whereas the business, my company, feels really different than it did you know, five, six, seven years ago in ways that I wouldn't have expected, um, the fact that I deal with uh, music and with the people who make it um, and, and my reputation is only as important as my relationships in the business, um, you know, that's uh, constant and, and as expected. Can, how, how can you sum up what your role is? I mean, when I think of music publishing, I think of so many different aspects of it. I mean, you know, you're trying to plug songs, I guess, and, and get other artists to cover songs that are written by writers that you represent, mm -hmm. try to get songs placed into films and TV shows collect mechanical royalties, co collect performance rights royalties. Well, the PROs do that, but it comes through you, I guess. I mean, um, where, where do you got, I mean, can you just talk about your role and where you fit in the, in the overall scheme of things? Sure, well, I, I represent songwriters um, who are currently working today. Um, and my job is, um, you know, my company's job is, is to get them work. Um, so like a Hollywood talent agency works for actors, um, you know, uh, we work for musicians, for songwriters. So there's broadly two kinds of creative work we do. Um, one is uh, setting up collaborations um, and getting recording artists to cover songs by our songwriters. So, you know, for example, um, we have a writer who's the singer of a band called X Ambassadors um, that are a band, he fronts the band and, and they've got their own material, um, but he's actually a really good writer um, and he's now a co-writer on Rihanna's new single as uh, a songwriter rather than an artist. Um, so we're often now, you know, sometimes it's us that sets, it, sets that relationship up, sometimes it's the manager, um, but we are in the business of creating those types of connections. Um, we also are, are in the business of, of, of marrying songs with films, television uh, shows, advertising, advertisements, um, and so forth. So, uh, for example, um, we represent Lord, who's a, a well-known recording artist, um, and we created a situation uh, for her where she had, a, her song was the end title in the last Hunger Games movie, but in addition to that, um, we negotiated an opportunity for her to curate the entire soundtrack of the movie. 
Um, so that allowed her to create a lot of collaborations and interesting sessions. She did the whole thing herself, by the way. It was pretty amazing. Um, but we got a lot of other artists involved in that. Um, and, and so, so that, that broadly, between the ex-ambassador's ex -ambassadors example of a pure collaboration and the Lord Hunger Games example of where uh, music and, and other entertainment uh, come together, that's broadly what we do creatively. Um, be, you know, that's probably 60% of what my company does is that type of activity. Um, we also handle the back end of all of the rights that we represent, um, which means that we collect money um, on a global basis, we account through to our writers, um, and we generally keep track of the music publishing rights. Um, for my company is really based on the creative work that we do, that's how we compete. And so when we think about priorities, the creative part of our business in terms of uh, focus, but also in terms of headcount and investment is really the priority. Can, can you talk about more what you mean by that, the creative work? That's uh, um, uh, A&R, uh, which, uh, which has two parts to it. One is finding songwriters um, that need a publisher and, uh, and signing them. Um, and on the other hand, once you have them signed, taking their songs and getting uses for their songs, so getting people to perform the songs. Um, so that's A&R. Um, and then the other big component is creative licensing, which is synchronization licensing. So we have six people in our company that do that. Um, we have a very active um, uh, program where we sign writers who work particularly well in film or television shows or advertisements, um, and we run a monthly camp for them um, where we give them assignments and create collaborations that we think would be interesting to pitch for uh, synchronization. Um, and it's become a bit like a family. Um, so, you know, the synchronization business uh, is a real core part of what we do, and, and it's how we're able um, to uh, service so many of our clients. Do you sign unknown songwriters or only people who are well known? Uh, we sign tons of unknown people. Yeah, I mean, we have a, this uh, one of our great success stories right now is a, is a, is a guy called Aaron Wright, um, who was signed, uh, introduced to us by uh, Chop Shop, which is a music supervision company that we are very close to. Alexandra Patsavas. Um, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. And, and uh, she's a very good friend of ours, wonderful executive. Um, and, and um, Did the music for Grey's Anatomy and many other yeah. well-known shows. Right. And, uh, and Aaron Wright came to us through her. Um, and he uh, is a you know, young songwriter trying to earn a living um, you know, uh, uh, writing music um, at a very early stage in his career, um, but wrote great songs for film and TV. Um, so we signed him up, and he just got a big break because he wrote one of the songs in the show Empire uh, that Courtney Love covered. Um, on Empire? <laughs> and on Empire. <laughs> Yeah. Well, okay. And <laughs> um, and that and and it it the the album I believe was the first uh, television soundtrack to debut number one on the top two hundred. Um, so uh, that opened up a bunch of doors for him, um, and now he's got some real cuts. Um, so you know we is got he an him. artist as well? He's an artist, but he's mostly a writer. So does he have a record deal? Are you trying to get him a record deal? He's, we're mostly, he's mostly writing for other people now. But we've got a bunch of co-writes going for him now, not just for synchronization, but also for, you know, for legitimate, you know, re real pop stuff. Can we talk about hip hop and sure. music publishing? Because when I talk to yes. groups of students, the first question is always, well, I'm a rapper, and I want, I mean, I want to make music, but I have lots of samples in my music. Or I'm a rapper, and I create my own songs, and I have my own sound collage. Um, but I never know how to address the question of songwriting and rights ownership in the context of hip hop, when music is assembled more like as a computer collage, rather right. than somebody sitting at a piano or a guitar and coming up with, with words and melodies. So how, as a publisher, how do you deal with, I mean, you've got hip hop artists like DJ Mustard mm -hmm. and, and others on your roster. How, how do you approach 
pub, uh, hip hop from a publisher's perspective? Well, it, it's definitely more complicated than other kinds of music uh, because of the sampling aspect of it. So there's a lot of derivative works in 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 uh, in hip hop. So you so know, is that how you copyright it? Is as a deri derivative work? Or something? Um, no, no. There, there's a separate copyright, um, but you have to clear your samples. So you know, it, with a rock band, they're playing their own music um, on instruments. Uh, so there, there's there's no third party that you have to get a clearance from. Um, on hip hop, sometimes on a hip hop track, you can have 13 or 14 writers because of the amount of sampling that's going on. Um, and, and, and so I, I think one of the most important things for uh, songwriters who are interested in hip hop, um, and, and that really comes in two forms. Um, there are rappers who write their own lyrics um, that are equivalent to top line writers in, in, in pop music who write lyrics and melody. Um, or there are producers who do the track beds, you know, do the beats. Um, and, and, and more really for producers, but also sometimes for, for, for uh, rappers, uh, it's really important that songwriters track what samples they're using in their material. Um, because the worst nightmare is that you have a song that goes, like really becomes a hit, and it's reacting everywhere in the world and all of a sudden you figure out that there's a James Brown sample in the drum track that you didn't know was there, you could have to pull that record off of every place that it's being sold. And, and there's no way that as a, as a company, I can police every single beat that's delivered to me um, for, uh, you know, for every sample that's in it. Um, so it's really important for anybody who's interested in creating hip hop that you really keep your uh, track sheets clean and you know what's in your uh, your music. If I'm a producer, a hip hop producer, like if I'm a Manny Fresh or somebody like that and I go in the studio with a, a rapper who's a lyricist and I put together a beat and even if I'm not using any samples whatsoever, you know, I get my friend to come in and play a, a bass line and I take two seconds of the bass line and I chop it up and I make a beat out of that and it's totally, or you know, created in the studio Am I a songwriter? Is that how my stuff is is recorded? Or you mean the producer? Yeah. Oh yeah, 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 totally. Okay. I mean, Mustard is one of our biggest clients. A phenomenally successful guy. He's had twenty four you know, top charting songs in the past six months, um, and he's. I mean, yeah, he's he's a he's a producer, uh, but he's a writer because he's he's creating the music. Now, in the, in the rock music business, it doesn't work that way, um, at least not traditionally. The producer is somebody who comes in and, and contributes to the sonic element of the recording, but doesn't usually have songwriter rights. But in, in hip hop, a producer is the, the person who, who creates the beats, creates the, the, the bad. Also in dance music, like Diplo is a client of ours, um, and he, um, a lot of what he does is production, but he's a songwriter because he's actually creating the music. Um, so yeah, absolutely. The produce, producers in hip hop are, are, are some of the most important songwriters in pop music, for sure. Gotcha. We have a question over here. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, hello. Um, so I was wondering what's the law here about copyrights, about the sampling? Like uh, you said something about the James Brown sample, for instance. Like is there a length? Like it has to be like um, more than 10 seconds or something? Or like does it have to be recreated with instruments and just not resampled? Um, sampled? That's a, uh, that's a very good question. Um, it, it is not a standardized um, structure in the law. Um, you have to actually get permission depending on the context. Um, that said, there, uh, it's been going on for a long time now, so hip hop really came about in the 90s. So, you know, there's been 25 years of people sampling other people's material. So it's become somewhat standardized in the business. Um, there are agencies that clear samples on behalf of, um, of uh, songwriters, um, and they negotiate it on a relatively standard set of terms. For example, it's pretty well understood that if something is in the chorus, it's worth more than if it's in the verse. If something is recognizable clearly, um, it, it's, it, it's worth more than if it's you know, just a background element. Um, so it happens relatively efficiently, but the sampled artist has the right to say no. Um, and often that is what happens. Um, and sometimes if the, the sampled artist, you know, if I use a James Brown song and the James Brown estate says no, there are people who will try to approximate the sound without 
infringing the copyright, and that can become a little bit, uh, you know, of an artisan type of thing that can toe the line. Um, but in general, it's pretty well accepted. Where you run into issues is with a really iconic song um, where the artist just doesn't want the song to be identified in the context that the, that the um, uh, uh, rapper is trying to put it in. We just ran into one of those situations with a very iconic uh, Broadway copyright that we represent um, where the family wasn't comfortable with the, the um, the context in which their, their, their song was being used, and they said no. So they have the right to say no. Okay. So the artist can always choose uh, if this song, does, he does, if he doesn't want the song to be used like for advertising or something, he always has the right to say no? Okay, that, 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 that's, uh, that's a little bit different with, with the synchronization right. The, I'm t I was speaking about sampling, um, but I in our contracts with our songwriters, they almost always have the right to approve or disapprove of a synchronization license, which is a, a license to a film or a television show or an advertisement. They almost always have the right to say, to say no. And, and it would not be in our interest to be using one of our songwriters' uh, works in a way that they were not comfortable with. So we, we always run it by them. Hi, we have a question. Hi, um, how do you basically find and determine um, who your company represents? How do they get to you? Uh, is there a screening process of some sort? And also, I have a second question, I'll let you answer that. Um, well, it happens in a lot of different ways. Um, there's not a formal screening process, really. Um, we have an a &R staff. So um, you have an a &R there, staff. There are uh, six of them. Um, and we look at a lot of different writers for a lot of different reasons. Um, you know, some of it, there is information available um, in the market, certainly in the pop music business. Um, you look at things like, uh, you know, are the songs being played on the radio? Um, are, the, are, are there uh, uh, sales on the iTunes store of singles of their songs? Um, what is their history of being used in films, television, advertising? Uh, Shazam is a big one. You know, if, if, if the, a lot of people are trying to figure out what a song is, that means that they probably like it. Um, I'm, I'm talking in terms of um, a, a small independent person. Uh, I'm a, a songwriter. I'm not a songwriter, but I'm yeah. a songwriter that writes good music, I believe, and have heard that it's, you know, it's good. How does a guy like myself yes. get to you? or get to a company like yours. You um, come to the Sync Up conference. Yeah, well, we're here now. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a songwriter, either of those things, but in my heart I am, but well, the, I'm kind the, of representing someone else. The, the publishing deal usually happens a little later on in an artist's career um, than uh, a, a record deal or a management deal. Um, and, and that's usually because um, the contracts that we do, you know, the relationships that we have with writers, um, are usually best for the writer and for the publisher right. um, when there's a sense of, uh, of, uh, of the value of the, of the songs in the market. Um, uh, you don't want to do a publishing deal too early in right. general. Right. Um, and, 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 and for us, it's often better for us to see what, how, how a songwriter's works are performing in the market before we sign somebody up because we invest so much time in working with our clients that we want to make sure we know exactly where we're trying to take them. Um, as a songwriter who's interested in getting your work used, right. I think it's really important to get your music out there. And, and when you're getting your music out there, so that means the internet makes, you know, there's a lot of challenges that the internet uh, uh, brings about in the music business, um, but there are also a lot of benefits. And one of the things is you can make your music available and, and in a lot of different low-cost ways. And you can track what's happening with it. So, you know, for example, uh, it's really important to have um, a Bandcamp page, a, a SoundCloud page, um, a YouTube uh, uh, page that's, that aggregates all of your stuff. Make sure your music is out there. Now, when you're doing that, mm. Make sure, and, and I know that sometimes this is hard for, 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 for musicians and songwriters and artists to hear, but really focus on what is your best material. Don't put everything you have out there. If somebody sends me their material and they send me 15 songs, you're not pointing me to, right to where you right. think your shiniest penny is. 
And so the thing that you really have to do is concentrate on getting your stuff up on the internet in an organized fashion and, and, and curate it. And then make sure you use social media mm. to, to, to get the word out about what you're doing. I mean, we look at Twitter followers. We look at reactivity. So what we're interested in is if people hear your material, do they like your material? And there are ways that even at a very early stage in your career, you can begin to um, uh, demonstrate that kind of reactivity. Uh, you should make your stuff available through, there's many ways to make your songs available on iTunes, on Spotify, through aggregators like uh, TuneCore and CD Baby. You know, your music should be out there. If you're in your house working on an opus, but it's not out there in the world, there's no chance for opportunity to happen. Mm. And so I think the most important thing is that you as a songwriter are an entrepreneur, you're in the business of yourself and your music, and you have to make sure that it, it is available wherever possible in the best possible way. Outstanding, one last thing. Um, are, is there a specific genre that you, your company looks for? Or, I mean, I know that you probably have artists on, in, on you know, various kind of, you know, various rappers, different things like that, but is there one that you kind of focus on mainly or? Not, not really. We're, we're in every genre of music, um, except jazz and classical, uh, which is sort of a different business um, in the music publishing business is handled in a different way. Um, but we're in every genre of music. Um, and, and, and from our point of view, you know, we, we, we like the fact that we represent songs that have lives in all sorts of different ways. Um, so, you know, depending on what kind of music you, you do, uh, your career is going to develop in a different way. I mean, hip hop records happen in one way, um, rock and roll records happen in another way, country records happen in another way. It, it's blending up a little bit now in kind of an interesting way. Um, you know, especially the country market, like if you look at country now, like all of a sudden it's blending with pop in all sorts of ways that, you know, when we opened a Nashville office a couple years ago, it was like a completely different world. And now it's like, it's starting to cross over a lot more, but still, you know, country records have country lives and, you know, hip hop records have hip hop lives and a lot of it's driven by radio format and, you know, we like the fact that we're in all that. We're in the business of good music. Um, the Blurred Lines decision brought up issues of copyright ownership and the, the, the rules surrounding protecting music and I, I, the, the case itself as we talked about on the phone last week is, is complicated and I don't want to get into the weeds of the specifics of why that ruling was made or, or the specifics about it. What actually caught my eye more than anything else was a reaction to the Blurred Lines decision that was in the New York Times where the reporter was making the case that the, the verdict in that case, all it pointed up was, in his opinion, that Iggy Azalea ripped off DJ Mustard. That's, <laughs> the, well, yes. But the, the other point was that, that it was a, a decision defending an outmoded copyright framework. And that but by having a um, copyright standard that is based on sheet music, we are ignoring the way music is made today. And the, really the question ultimately comes down to when can you as a publisher protect the rights of a songwriter when people are going and ripping off their sound all the time? And so, so you brought up the Iggy Azalea and, and the DJ Mustard, which actually, if you wouldn't mind, Tony, do we have that Iggy Azalea clip? Can you play a second of it? All right, now let's hear the DJ Mustard. So that may not be the best example, but there's actually, there's actually a better example that, that's actually in the beat. That's actually in the beat. Um, there's a better example where, where, where in the beat of Fancy, um, there's a there's a vocal on the up and and it sounds very much like a like a mustard beat actually from Rack City, um, and you know the, it, it's an interesting example. I, um, you know I, I can't go too much into the mechanics of that. Um, 
other than, than to say, you know, there's one situation where you listen to something and you say, look, that obviously sounds the same. Um, but when you get into the mechanics of copyright infringement, it's a much more complicated conversation. Um, so the blurred lines thing, um, people talk about the sheet music aspect uh, of it. Um, and that's actually not technically what went on. Um, technically what went on is that they could, from my understanding, I'm not a copyright lawyer, I've just been doing this a long time, um, but my understanding is that um, the, the heirs, the Marvin Gaye heirs, were not able to, build, to, to bring a claim based on the recording because they had a copyright issue with the recording. Now, so they weren't. They didn't eight, have clear ownership of the master. I think that 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 is my understanding, and so they had to bring their copyright infringement case based on the song, which may, which means the pattern of the notes separate from how it was recorded. If you listen to blurred lines, you know it, it, the problem is the motif that it sounds very much like a Marvin Gaye song, not for any one particular reason. I mean, the cowbell people talk about a cowbell, but it it, it it just feels like a Marvin Gaye record. Well, so that is the question, though. So if if I'm a, if I'm a, if I'm DJ Mustard, and Iggy Azalea goes and does a song that sounds like one of my songs, is there anything that you can do about it? Well, it, 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 it depends on whether you think right. you actually it's, have a copyright it's infringement got my case. Groove. It's got you, my you, feel. You, it feels like have one to, of my songs. You have to demonstrate access, for one. Okay. Um, so you have to demonstrate that one writer knew about the other writer's material. Okay. Um, and then you have to, on the, com on the composition side, which was what ended up happening with the Blurred Line situation, is that you have to represent that, that, that a unique pattern of notes in the song is exactly identical to a unique pattern in, in the infringed song. And, and, and that means th that's when you turn to musicology. There's no other way to do it. So it's not really sheet music, it's, it, it's musicology. It's somebody sitting down and saying, look, on the one hand, there are a million songs from the 1950s that are one, four, five chord progression. Those are not infringing one another. That was just something that was going around and people were doing it to blues progressions normal. But, but in a situation where it, there's a clear, unique pattern of notes that one writer lifts from another, it's copyright infringement. You just have to make the, make the case. What's unusual about the Blurred Lines thing, I mean, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that was a copyright infringement, to be honest. What's unusual about it is that it went to trial. Because this happens all the time. We get claims all the time. We make claims all the time. 99% of the time. It, it settles because it's just not worth having the conversation. Musicians influence one another. It happens all the time. And, and to some degree, you're only as good a, a, as how obscure your influences are. I mean, everybody's influenced by somebody. So if I owned the master to the Marvin Gaye song and somebody, along, uh, somebody comes along and makes another record that feels like one of my songs, may not have the same exact melody, may not have the same chord progression, but it feels like one of my songs. Is, should I be able to prevent somebody from making a song that feels like one of my songs? Well, the, the, the law traditionally doesn't go on feeling. Right, and I, so I think the Times writer was you, saying that it should. You, well, you, you, you'd, have to, you'd have to make a case that, that, that the specific elements of the recording were, were copied, in effect. I mean, it, you know, records sometimes feel the same. I, you know, they, there's, there's records that are made that are influenced by bands 20 years ago that have the same vibe of a Led Zeppelin record. But well, that doesn't mean thinking it's... That Lenny, how many times has Lenny Kravitz ripped off the, 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 the hi-hat sound of Led Zeppelin records? I mean, should they be able to do anything about that? But, it, it, uh, well, this, this, is, this is where you get a little bit into the technical zone that's not really my field of expertise, which is copyrights of sound recordings. And I'm a total expert. Right? Um, you know, ex ex exactly what the um, legal bar is for a copyright on a sound recording, I'm not totally sure, to be honest. Um, but my guess is that it, it would go along the same lines of the composition, that you'd have to demonstrate that A, there was access so that they knew um, you know, how something was done, which in the case of a Marvin Gaye song, it's universal, so that's not an issue. But, but then you'd have to actually demonstrate that the elements were themselves copied. I mean, lots of people use cowbell, so, you know, the cowbell itself, unless uh, it was, you know, uh, I guess cleared a particular hurdle of accuracy, um, would not in itself be deemed uh, uh, an infringement. But that's not my field. It, it sound recording copyrights are not my field of expertise. I'm a publisher. And you can always use more cowbell. 
Always. We, we all, we, we, we Glockenspiel. <laughs> we have a question over here. Hi there, and thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. I'm going to be a bit of a devil's advocate and bring this back to the independent artists because I don't think anyone in this room is dealing with multi-million dollar infringement problems. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people talk about how great it is for the independent artists that the music industry basically you know, dissolved and the internet and everything opens up. I personally feel like there's a lot of disadvantages because now I'm expected to be a videographer, a graphic designer, a market shoot, mm -hmm. you know, a fucking, doing all these different tasks that I'm... A haiku writer I'm not, on exactly, Twitter. Exactly, and I'm not good at those things. It's not that I think I'm a diva and shouldn't have to. It's just not my field of expertise. And yesterday in the sync session and also today, I feel like I'm hearing things that, that make me feel a bit despondent because ultimately it seems like it still comes down to the same old thing of who you know and if someone is turning you on to something. I mean, because like, with publishing deals, for example, in the old days, a songwriter used to get a publishing deal very early in their career and their songs would be exploited for an artist. And now I feel like I'm hearing like you have to be a success already because you did it in order to get someone else to who's in the business to, to invest in you. Like, what, what's your take well, on that? Well, no, 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 I understand that, um, but not, not necessarily. I, I do think, however, that music, no matter what, and no matter how commercial, um, you know, how pop it is or whatever, um, is about building an audience. So, you know, one of my uh, oldest clients who I've been, who I've been with, who's been with us almost since the beginning of the, uh, of the company is a guy called Ted Leo, uh, who's got a band called Ted Leo and the Pharmacist. Ted is super punk. Right, and, and he, he's a touring artist, never been on the radio, um, but people, re his audience really believes in what he's doing, and they follow him wherever he goes. So that was something Ted did, you know? So I, I, it, it's not, it not, you know, it, it, it's not so much that, that you know, people don't get signed who don't have a massive level of commercial success or don't get signed until they're already so popular. But, you know, I'm looking for people who people react to in some way or another. They, that can be a small group of people that reacts to them or it can be a very large group of people that reacts to them. But I'm looking for musicians who play music that when people hear it, they like it. And in the case of Ted Leo, that could be 50,000 people who buy his album. Um, he's as valuable to me in, in, in my business a, a, as my biggest clients are who sell millions of records all over the world. But, but I do think it is the responsibility of a musician to build an audience. That's what musicians have been doing since the beginning of time. And I used to do it when I played hardcore. Like, you know, we'd have 350, 400 kids show up and see us in, you know, in, in Chicago. And we were from New York. And that was like, we're doing our job. Now, it was never going to be mainstream music, but there were other bands, you, you know, that, that were selling five times the tickets and other bands that maybe wrote great music, but for whatever reason, they weren't able to connect with people. And so I, I think it is a music, I, I agree that it's unfortunate that it's become a musician's responsibility to write quippy things on Twitter and be like a joke writer and, you know, make a website and, you know, do all these other things when they should be just making music. But just making music isn't just writing songs and recording them. It's also getting out in front of people, making fans, building relationships, you know, finding champions. It, it, it's, it's also that. And so we look for people who are doing that stuff. Not necessarily, they don't, they, their reach doesn't have to be massive. We have 350 writers. And, and a lot of them are, are, are people who just, you know, barely make a living doing what they're doing. But we help them make more money than they otherwise would. We have another question. Yes. Um, pertaining to the, the previous conversation you had and also to her question as well, um, you're talking about the musicology and some of the technology involved in the production side and the copyright issues that related to that. It kind of a few different things conflate my mind. One, the back end technology for Shazam, some of those things that are coming out where you can analyze the music and, and that technology. I think of a guy that was on the panel a few years ago, I think, up with Ralph Simon who, I forgot his name, but he had a technology that could break down a song and actually recreate it in a different language so he could take a Lil Wayne song and recreate it in Spanish just from his technology. So breaking down the notes... That was Robert album. Singerman. Robert Singerman, yes. So it break down, broke down the notes and everything. So the, the technology is changing so much with music that it's becoming so di you know, digital, not just in digital format from CDs and such, but, but digital even beyond that. But pertaining to the, the curation and the, and the promotion aspect of it, 
are you looking at things like big data analytics or these new tools that are out there where when you mentioned that you can see what people are searching for on Shazam or, you know, I think there's a corollary in the publishing world where everybody's, a lot of people are going to e-readers and e-readers can track what you underline or what you highlight or how long you've stayed on the page and that information is going back to publishers and saying, here's what subplots in the story people were interested in. Are you seeing, are you looking at that in music to see where you're tracking the analytic component of YouTube views or other characteristics of Shazam searches to see what is of interest out there that maybe wouldn't be apparent from purely just a taste level? Um, so so d data is, is increasingly used in the music business to make decisions, um, both on the record side and the publishing side to, to discover music. Um, you know, I, I do want to be clear in that, you know, on a good day, you've got from data maybe 49% of the information you need to make a decision. It's ultimately a creative business. You have to know music and understand music. There's no way to do it by numbers. Um, but data can be very helpful um, in making a decision. Um, what we look for is data that measures reactivity. So that less than sort of consumer behavior or you know uh, momentum type of data, you know how many uh, 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 you know uh, page views you have on the internet is less interesting to us. What's more interesting is if people hear your song, do they like your song? So Shazam is a really interesting one because Shazam is like you know we signed Lord right Royals was out. Um, and, and, and it, it wasn't what it is now, but it was on its way. Um, and one of the big data points was that it was the number one Shazam song in the United States. So that means that people didn't know who Lord was at the time, but they were hearing the song, and the first thing they did was like, oh my God, what is that? And they took an action based on their interest in the song to find out what it was. That tells us that if they hear it, they like it. The other, the other uh, example of that is we know where songs are added on the radio. So we know if one of our writers has a song that gets added to WHTT in Philadelphia, right? So we look then at the iTunes, iTunes gives information by market about how many singles it's selling. So if we know that a, a, a record is played on a radio station in Philadelphia, and then we see the same day that that record's being played that the sales increase, in, in Philadelphia on iTunes, we know that when people hear it, they like it. And so, so that type of information is useful as an ingredient in making decisions about, uh, about, about investing in songs. Um, but again, I wanna be clear that, you know, anybody who's trying to do this business by numbers is gonna die a painful death because ultimately at the end of the day, it's music and music happens when music happens, how music happens, and it, it's just, that's the way it goes. And some of the greatest things that happen have no data the minute before they explode. And so, uh, you know, if you had told me five years ago that DJ Mustard would be where he is today, like all over every chart, there was no data that was gonna tell you that was gonna happen. And so it's an ingredient, but it's not, it's not the answer. Do we have any other questions for Matt? No? Okay. Um, well, we could dive into Spotify and all that stuff, but I have a feeling that that's probably just more high-level artist stuff that's, that's not grassroots stuff. So we're, we're just going to go to Jazz Fest. <laughs> well, I want to thank Matt Pincus for coming all the way to New Orleans and speaking to the Sync Up Conference. Thank you so much, Matt. It's been a pleasure having you.